Myself, uh, Karthi Gupta, I represent 21st Century U.S. Division. I've been with the company for uh, last seven years, and uh, we've been doing U.S. properties for the last four years. Before we get started, I'll uh, just uh, read the standard disclaimers. All the information I'm giving today, it's uh, general information only, and it's advisable that uh, you obviously uh, seek your financial planner's advice before making any financial uh, decisions. So, uh, as uh, Eric has already briefed you up, my background, I'm a chartered accountant by profession. Uh, I really no love number crunching, and uh, my dad, he's an accountant. He used to uh, be an accounts teacher, and uh, I come from education background, so I've been uh, doing accounting all my life. So with the 21st Century U.S. Property Division, uh, we, usually, we started four years ago after the global financial crisis. And the main reason was Jamie's vision when he saw that the property prices in U.S. were at the bottommost point and the Australian dollar was really high. So we started investing in U.S. and started from Phoenix. Every year from 2011, we used to take some property tours to America with a group of our clients. So here are just some, some of the snapshots of uh, all the trips we've done. So some of the clients are happy and they've purchased their properties. This was uh, back in 2013 uh, with a group of around 25, 30 people. And most of them ended up buying properties. That's uh, the trip uh, last year. So pretty much every year we, we, t we take some clients. Now we've also seen cases where people individually travel to America, so they inform us uh, if they've purchased the properties, we organize uh, meetings with the local uh, team, with the property managers and the consultants. And obviously they can go and check their properties or if they want to have a look at the properties before they make a decision, uh, we help them out there as well. So some of the, some of the trips, that's obviously Jamie and Lou. So where do we buy in US? Like we started from Phoenix, we are not buying in Phoenix anymore. Phoenix was a capital growth market. We went into Dallas and Houston. Those markets have risen as well. Now, our main focus for last year and a half, two years, has been uh, the Midwest. So we initially started buying in Kansas City, and now we are buying in Northwest Indiana, which is 30, 40 minutes from downtown Chicago. And Northwest Indiana is one of our uh, main uh, market right now. And the reason why we are in that market is for cash flow purposes. Most of the clients who enter into that market are able to make anywhere between 16 to 18% gross returns. So typical property prices are, they start from $45,000, $50,000, and you can buy them up for up to $65,000, $70,000, $75,000. So if you spend $70,000, $75,000, you'll be making around $1,100 rent, gross rent per month. Uh, a quick snapshot of how the U U.S. market has been performing over the last uh, three years, uh, uh, three to six years. So after GFC, what happened? Uh, wh what was the main impact of GFC? People started losing their jobs, and uh, obviously when, when they have defaulted on their, uh, like lost their jobs, they started defaulting on their mortgages. They started giving away their properties to the banks, and there were lots of foreclosures happening around that time. The US economy was distressed. People were not confident buying more properties, so which led to uh, like the record level of inventory. Uh, the US dollar was beaten down, and in comparison to Australian dollar, uh, Aussie dollar was really strong. So that was the period of 2009 to 11. In that time, we've seen a lot of international investor activity. And the main reason for that was locals were not buying, banks were not lending, and Chinese funds, Euro European funds, Australians, everyone was buying in US. 2011 to 13 was a moderate period where we saw that there is reduced disclosure, uh, re reduction in foreclosure activity. The currency is slowly and slowly coming back, so it was above parity level, and slowly and slowly it was between that 95 to $1 range. And there was a little bit of local investor activity as well. Okay, so that was 2011 to 13, which, which was our main period like, of activity when we purchased a lot and lots of clients have uh, taken the benefits. 2013 to 15, now things are stabilizing in America. So what's happening, the US dollar is getting stronger, the real estate is coming back up again, and we've seen that uh, the Australian dollar is obviously uh, sitting around 77 to 78 cents level. 
Uh, there are not many new foreclosures happening nowadays in comparison to what, what was the scenario back in 20, uh, 29 to 2011. So there are less number of foreclosures, which means there's more competition for us. When we go and uh, bid on the properties, there are obviously less number, uh, there's less inventory. And uh, when we make our offers, obviously uh, we have to pay a little bit higher price, but still it's very attractive because of the cash flow returns. And when I show you, show you some examples, you'll see that the very initial deals, we were grossing 25% gross returns. Now it's gone down to 16 to 18%. So that's reflected in, in, in the returns there. So what are the main reasons for investing in Northwest Indiana or obviously the market which we are in? Uh, one of the main reasons is um, it's, it's close to downtown Chicago. So we do get the benefit of a really big city. Okay? And uh, the housing prices have dropped significantly. Uh, most of the properties we buy, their market value would be 30 to 50% uh, above what it used to be like uh, uh, the current price at which we acquire is basically at 30 to 40% discount. So if we are buying a property for $50,000, it used to be worth seventy-five dollars to $80,000. So we are getting deals at a good discount. The main reasons, as uh, we've discussed, the rental income. Cash flows is one of the biggest factor, and I'll show you in my examples how it helps uh, generating the cash flows from US properties. Uh, capital appreciation is possible and it is happening. Uh, just from our point of view, three years ago, I've missed out on a couple of deals. We make offers. We used to make offers, but we were very rigid in our criteria that we have to take at least 40% discount on whatever the asking price was. Now, if I look back, I think that why did I miss on the, those deals? We should have taken all of those deals because they've gone up in value. So, capital appreciation is definitely uh, doable. And foreign exchange gains is another important factor. Now, many people ask me this question that, is foreign exchange still likely to happen given that the dollar is at 76 cents, 77 cents? Uh, if you guys are reading economic news, uh, there, there are talks about that Reserve Bank of Australia might reduce the interest rate further uh, by end of this year. And also there are talks in America that the Federal Reserve is going to increase the interest rates in US uh, in, in America because they haven't changed their interest rates. So what it means is American banks are talking the possibility of increasing their rates. Australian banks want to reduce the rates. So that means US dollar is going to be stronger. Aussie dollar is still going to be weak. So uh, and currently, like um, uh, the Reserve Bank uh, governor, like he mentioned that Aussie dollar is still overpriced, and they are expecting that 68 to 72 cent level is a reasonable level. So my, my prediction is by end of this year, it might be around 70, 72 cents. And by September next year, it will be around 65 to 67 cents, which means there's still another 10 to 12 cents uh, to benefit, which, which makes around 20%. Uh, this is, um, before I show you some examples, this, uh, one of my clients, like um, he, he works for uh, military, and uh, he was uh, in Chicago. So we coordinated, and he met me there. Uh, my, half of my life I, I spent in US, like I'm going next week again for five weeks. I was there back in January. So pretty much I, I travel to US once every three to four months to acquire more properties. And most of my trips, I end up coordinating and meeting some of my clients over there. So I'll quickly uh, show you this video from Chicago, and then I'll show you some numbers. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, take things from there. Hi, uh, good evening. This is Karthik from uh, 21st Century US Property, and I'm here in Chicago with Ben Curry. So he's uh, one of our US Property members. So Ben, tell me about your experience in uh, Northwest Indiana. Like you have a property here on Route 3, and uh, we did uh, travel. Uh, we went to Northwest Indiana and went through different suburbs. So how did you feel about different properties and all the all the different neighborhoods? Yeah, look, it was um, it was really interesting going around to visit them all today. So really, yeah. really interesting to see Hammond. Yep. See more neighborhood and also see some of the um, some of the other suburbs too. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like, uh, how did you like the drive from uh, here to Chica uh, from Chicago to Indiana and the industry? Uh, which yeah, comes in Northwest Indiana. Again, really, really interesting that to see it all. You know, it's really good, uh, good highways from the center of downtown Chicago yep. down through to, to Hammond. Um, and uh, you know, quite a lot of industry around here, around the East Chicago area and the Hammond area. Yep. You know, um, a lot of uh, refineries. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, 
when I go there, we, uh, we stay in Chicago. Chicago is our base, and we buy in northwest Indiana. Chicago is in the state of Illinois, and most of our properties are in Indiana, which is around 30 to 40 minutes drive from there. So the reason why we are buying in that market is there's a lot of employment, a lot of industry. There's, there are a couple of steel mills, ArcelorMittal steel mill, British Petroleum Refinery, Whiting Refinery, a couple of other small industries. And what I've also experienced in the last four years is people talk about buying in LA or New York or big cities. Usually, if you have to make a decent return, it's always good to buy in a smaller city because the kind of crime or wrong things, uh, the chances of bad crime happening is remote, and you can manage things properly. So we are buying 40 minutes away from Chicago. It still gets advantages of a bigger city, but we have a nice, small, stable city with a lot of local employment. Uh, this is just a sample of um, the management statement for uh, that particular client. So the columns in, like, uh, wherever I've highlighted in green, basically that's the rent coming in uh, and the checks paid out. Uh, and on the credit side, you can see that every month the tenants are paying rent. So that guy purchased this property uh, last year in June, and uh, he's been holding it for like 10 months, and he has already made $8,000 rent. He paid $65,000 for that property. So 8,000 USD in rent is equivalent to 11,000 Australian dollars. So that's already close to 13, 14% net returns. This is the very, very first deal uh, which I did for, uh, for the company back in 2012. Now this house was listed for $85,000 in the local market, and it was listed for 85K back in 2010, but it never sold for 18 months. So they reduced the price from 85 to 60, 60 to 50, and uh, when we started buying in Phoenix, I was researching on some other markets, so I came across this property. When I went to Chicago, it was listed for 50,000. I made an offer for $15,000, okay? So because the reason why I made that offer was it, was it didn't sell for 18 months, and there were no buyers in that market. So I'm like, nobody's buying this. So I'm happy to pay 15 grand, and I can write to a check today. So if you want to take it, take it, otherwise we are not taking the deal. So the agent said, try to be reasonable, like it's listed for 50 and it's a duplex. So 15 wouldn't cover anything. I'm like, uh, what's the, what do you think, at what price will you get me the deal? He's like, we can try 25. I'm like, okay, uh, make an offer for 15, let's see what the counter is, and we'll take things from there. So I, I wrote the contract, we gave an offer for 15, the seller came back at 25, we ended up finalizing the deal for $22,000. So we bought it for 22, we spent around $13,000 on this house, and then paid some local commissions, the guys who helped me. So it costed us 40, 45. We kept it for a few months, sold it for 58. We made a decent profit, but the client is making $1,400 rent per month. Last year I offered him uh, in December, I said, um, I, I want to buy that property back from you. I can take it for 55, do you want to give it to me? Yep. So uh, he has already made 20, 25K in rent in the last two, two and a half years. And obviously, I'm, I'm happy to buy this house anytime from him. Like $1,400 USD rent is a no brainer. And the, the price at which client entered was above $1, like when dollar was at parity. So even if he sells at 55 today, that's worth 70,000 for him. So that client is definitely ahead of the game. Any questions? Okay, so I'll give you a really good example on high cash flows, why this cash flow is really important for us, and how we can maximize and take advantages from, from that uh, situation. How many of you in the audience have investment properties here and have equity in the houses? Okay, quite a few. So basically, let's say for example, you've got a property worth half a million dollars and your current loan is $160,000. So in this example, what I've done is, okay, okay. so the property is worth half a million dollars, and that's an investment property in Australia. The current equity is $160,000. So how much can we borrow if we have to maximize our borrowing capacity at 80%? We can borrow another $240,000 because that's going to make 400K. 
So to borrow this extra $240,000, what's the current uh, rate of interest? Let's say it's 5% after everything. So 5% of $240,000 is $12,000 per annum, which is equals to $1,000 per month. I hope I'm not going too fast. Oops. Can I, can I have the slide, please? Yep. So uh, to, to borrow extra $240,000, anyone needs to make at least $1,000 per month to break even, correct? So with that $240,000, let's assume that we put all that money back into US properties. First thing what we'll have to do is, we'll have to convert that money into US dollars to buy more houses. So 240 AUD will mean it's 185K USD. So keep aside, out of that 185, what I would do is I'll keep aside $12,000 for next 12 installments because I don't know what, what can or cannot happen. So I'll just keep aside 12K so that I'm nice and good. I'll buy the first property, let's say for example, $53,000, second property for 60, and the third property for 60. So that's the remainder $173,000. So if I borrow that 240K, convert it into USD, so that's 185,000 US dollars. Out of that, what I'll do is I'll keep aside $12,000 so that I don't have to worry for interest for the next 12 months. And then I'll spend uh, 53 plus 60 plus 60, so that's $173,000. Now when I'm doing this, what I'll be able to achieve is I'll have three properties in America, which will give me a total gross return of $29,100. What was my cost, per annum cost? It was only 12,000. Now, from this gross return, if you deduct all your expenses, because you have to pay property managers, you have to pay insurance, property taxes, and all those things. So even if you deduct that 30% in expenses, you'll be able to get net 20,370. What's your cost? 12,000. So how much extra money you can make? You can make extra $8,300, okay? And this $8,300 will be good enough to cover up the cost for the initial 160K you had on that property. So pretty much by withdrawing your equity, reinvesting into US properties and making those cash flows, you can pay off your extra loan, okay? So it's not costing you any money. And this is a typical scenario which most of my clients are doing. Capital appreciation. So capital appreciation, it happens mainly because of the way we negotiate the kind of deals we get. Now, because we have been buying there for the last three to four years, we have a lot of local contacts. Most of the banks before they list properties with the local agents, uh, they directly have an informal chat with them and say, do you have any investors who want to buy? And properties come to, a, come to us first before they go on the listing sites. We also buy through uh, estate sales. So whenever, like, yeah, if, if the property is with the lawyers they, who are liquidating uh, the assets of a deceased estate, we, we get referrals to those kind of properties as well. And, and our main uh, key for negotiation is we'll do a quick close and cash settlement. So sometimes, like, properties are listed, we can say, we say, we'll settle in five days, and it'll be a cash settlement. So we attach the proof of funds along with our offers, and we go really strong. Now, Four years ago, it was amazing. Like, I used to get 50, I just used to throw a number that, okay, let's just throw this number and let's see where they are sitting, and we'll, we'll buy. But now, if I make offers, ridiculous offers, or discount by more than 20%, they knock back my offers. They don't take me seriously. So we, we always have to obviously see the value in the deal. Most of the deals we are buying, we know that their market value is much stronger because we are buying from the banks. So it depends upon supply and demand. It, dep it depends upon how much inventory is available and we accordingly negotiate from, uh, from the parties over there. Foreign exchange fluctuations. This is another uh, very important topic and uh, one of the main reasons uh, why obviously a lot of the clients who have invested in the past have been successful. Now this was the situation between 2011 to 13. Okay, so back in 2011, dollar was sitting at 1.025. Uh, in 2013, it came down to 90 cents. So anyone who put their money back in 11, if they were buying 100,000 US dollars worth of properties, they were supposed to send only 
Back in 2013, obviously that 100K has automatically become $111,000 in Australian terms uh, because of the foreign exchange fluctuations. Now, at today's obviously rates, the dollar is sitting at 77 cents. So if you have to buy a $100,000 property in America, you have to send around 129,000 Australian dollars, okay? So if you see the difference between 2011 and 15, in 2011 you were sending only 97,500, now you're sending 129,000 dollars. So that's a difference of 32,500, which is massive, okay? Now, I personally think that dollar is still going to go down to 70 cents and then 65. Now, if, personally, I'll stop buying when it touches 70 cents because the chances of us making foreign exchange gains would be limited because there'll be only three to five cent, dollar, uh, cent buffer and the chances of it going back up again is much higher, okay? So right now, it's, it's still a time when it's trading between 77, 75 to 80 cent levels. Now, just to... Uh, show you how the dollar looks like when it's at different points. So if it touches 70 cents, uh, one dollar is at 68 cents, we'll get extra 47 percent, okay? Right now when it's at um, one dollar is at 78 cents or 77 cents, uh, we are getting extra 30 percent. So obviously by, by dollar sliding to, and by another seven to eight cents, we make extra 15 to 20 percent. So every, every single cent drop in a dollar is giving you extra two cents. Now, these are the fluctuation charts, currency fluctuation charts, as you can see. Now, the dollar used to be at these levels of 65, 60 to 70 cent levels, but after GFC, when the US uh, economy was uh, in serious recession and they, they had major issues and Australian economy was doing fairly well, so it did go above parity, now it's sliding back down again. We expect that it's gonna to touch the bottom resistance level and, and most of the economists feel the same. So most probably we have another year, year and a half to play with and after 65 cents, it'll start catching up again. And, and it's kind of, uh, obviously it's a cyclic cycle. Any questions? Okay. Um, now, another example of, um, obviously, when we have Australian investment properties, uh, what do we do? We usually invest in investment properties for negative gearing because Australia is well known for fast capital growth, and uh, it, Australian properties are definitely not aus amazing for cash flows, like the kind of cash flows we make from US properties. It doesn't happen in Australia. So this is an example of typical Australian investment property where let's say an investment property is worth half a million dollars. Uh, it's giving you a rent for $2,000 per month. After all the expenses, uh, the net return, let's say it's 19,800, which is at 4%. You pay 5% interest rate to the bank. So your obviously net position is 5,000 negative, which is basically negative gearing. You also add in the um, depreciation and other things. To, to get your tax benefits. Now, if you just compare this with the US property situation, and uh, let's say in US we just invest only $100,000, so you can make up to $1,600 rent, gross rent per month, which is around $19,200 uh, per annum. After all the costs, it's gonna be around $13,700. So net percent would be 14% minus the 5% cost, so your net percent would be around 8,700, okay? So from Australian investment point of view, it's at 5,000 negative, and from US, it's 8,700 positive, but then in US, you've invested only $100,000. So when you times it by five, that's around 43, okay? So the big difference is Australian properties are known to go up in value, but at this stage, we don't know, like everyone's talking that there might be a bubble, we don't know exactly what the, what the future holds, okay? Now, most of my successful or uh, like the really happy clients are those who've got a couple of Australian properties. What they are doing is they are pulling out their equity because the interest rates are at the lowest levels, 4.5, 4.6. So one of the guys, like, uh, he's got, uh, he's a really good doctor from Sydney. He's got eight to $10 million worth of, uh, worth of equity in his properties. So he's pulled out million dollars and he's 
bought, already bought 12 houses, and he plans to buy another 10. And that's one of the main reasons why I'm going uh, next month, like uh, next week, because I have to go and obviously try and buy as many good deals for him as possible. So this is uh, like we've got a lot of clients who had been successful stories, and uh, and the main basically uh, their focus is always cash flows. They bought one property. Once that's successful, they go and buy another property. And they've been able to uh, basically come up with a deposit for the for the next properties or future properties just from the rental income they are making from the ex existing houses. These are uh, some of the examples of what we have sold. Most of these, pro like, they are just ordinary single-family houses and duplexes. So we've sold close to 225, 230 properties in that in that market. Uh, just recently. Uh, when I was there in January, we purchased a property uh, from a bank. It was a single family house and had a small structure in the back. So when I inspected the house, we just looked at the main single family house in the front and made an offer. We got that house for $38,000. And uh, we budgeted for repairs and all those things for around $20,000, $25,000. So we, we did all the work, put it back in the market. And while we were doing the repairs, kind of uh, I actually ended up selling the house to one of my clients for $70,000. So we made a small profit. And uh, in our budgets, we said it's going to get you around 900 rent. So when we were about to find the tenants, we actually found that there was a granny's apartment in the back, which could rent for an extra $600. So our budget was 900, but that owner is now getting $1,500 rent. So I was like, shit, what did we do? Like, we could have sold that house for another 10 or 15 we could have marked it up by extra 10, 15 grand because that's a good, good revenue. So that client is getting 24% gross, 18% net return. So it doesn't happen. It was a mistake, but it was a good mistake for the client. So these are some of the examples what we have done. Now this is, uh, I'm showing you a live example of how the house looks before we make a purchase. So we've just acquired this house. This is for sale. It's a nice single family house. and. Uh, Listed for 63, gross rent is 895. Uh, Daniel, can we please play that video for Vanderburg? Twenty-eight, twenty-six, Vanderburg Lake Station. Really nice, quiet area. Lots of families living in the area. So we got a new roof here. Siding is new. Windows are newer. Uh, it's a three bedroom, two bath. So we walk into this living room. We're gonna put an all new flooring, fresh paint. So this is the dining room here, and we got the two bedrooms on the left. It's the first bedroom, nice size bedroom. And then on this side, we got the second bedroom, lots of natural light. We got the furnace over here, nice condition. And then this is the first of the two bathrooms. Nice size bathroom, got the bathtub, toilet, vanity, everything looks in good shape. The bathroom flooring is in pretty good shape. This is the kitchen right here. The kitchen cabinets are in good shape. The plumbing looks good. Plenty of counter space. Another small little eating area. And you got a washer and dryer. Both look to be in excellent condition. Kitchen flooring looks pretty good. And right off the kitchen over here, we have the master bedroom. Nice size room, lots of natural light. And then you got the master bath. Bathtub, toilet, vanity, and a shower. So really nice unit. Three bedroom, two bath, in Lake Station. Uh, I think we'll get about 900 bucks a month in rent for this. Okay, and this is 2826 vendor. Okay, so this is an example of how and uh, how the house looks like when we purchase. Now, what will happen is we'll send our contractors. They'll redo all the new flooring. They'll do all the new paint. Uh, they'll check all the mechanicals. Now, when we purchase the house, the important things we look at is the condition of the roof, the condition of the windows, uh, the furnace, the electricals, the plumbing. 
because all those things are costly and obviously uh, they do cost a lot of money just in case there's a breakdown. And many of these houses have been vacant for a long time, so we need to make sure that all those things are in good working condition. So we've acquired this house. Now, within next three to four weeks, everything will be done. It's a three, three bedroom, two bath. We can rent it for 995, but we have estimated that worst case scenario will definitely get 900. And I'm quite confident that by end of next month, it will be fixed up and rented, okay? So this is just an example of what we've just uh, purchased. Now, this is another house. It's, uh, it's a smaller house, uh, single family again. And uh, this house is refurbished. Now, we acquired it. This is, an, again, an interesting case. I made an offer on this house last year back in June when I was in America. And uh, we paid a deposit of $2,500. We bought it for, I think, 30000 or something. So we made an offer. And there were some title issues. And it took six months for us to settle. And I forgot about making an offer on this house. So uh, late last year in November, December, the title company came, came back and said, everything's fixed up, and we can settle on the house. When do you want to settle? I'm like, which address are you talking about? So they sent us the details, and uh, kind of I had the videos in my archive. So I looked at the house. We settled on the property. And uh, now back in Jan, Feb, we just got it fixed up. So we've redone all the flooring, cleaned up the kitchen and stuff. So Daniel, can we please play the video as well for this one? Thirty-eight Eleven Parish in East Chicago. We have the city doing a lot of work on this uh, Parish Avenue, which is going to be good for the long-term value of the house. Let's have a look inside. Got a nice front porch here. Got new flooring. Carpet is brand new. Walls are painted. Nice wood paneling. Gives it a really nice warm feeling. This is the first bedroom over here. Freshly painted. New flooring. Looks in great shape. All the windows are updated. And you got the second bedroom here. Really great shape. Painted flooring. It's really good. And then you got the bathroom. Vanity, toilet, flooring. Everything is in great shape. All the windows have been updated. This is the kitchen. The cabinets look in great shape. New flooring. This is the third bedroom, the master bedroom. You can easily put a king size bed, nicely painted, new flooring. And then you got the bathroom on, um, on the side. It's got a master suite attached bathroom. Really nice big size room. And again, this is all new flooring throughout the house. Uh, new cabinets, freshly painted. Uh, so again, this is 3811 Parish in East Chicago. It's a three-bedroom, two. So now that's another example of a single-family house. Now that one again, it's a three-bed. Yep. Um, so when we purchase, say somebody purchase one, they sell one. Yeah. Yep. Do you have your contractors, and if somebody runs it out, <laughs> sorry. Who looks after the house? We've, if we've, somebody rents it out, then something's busted. No, no, we've and got a property management company. Right. So they collect all the rent, they find the tenants, they take care of all the utility bills, and they also have a team of contractors they send to do any repairs. And you would const constantly get updates of what's going on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my usual days, they start at like 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning. Right. And I'm, I'm up on the phone talking to the property managers, contractors, at one point of time, we always have eight to 10 new properties which, we, which are under offer, which we are either fixing up or we are making offers and trying to buy. So there's always work going on. Now, just uh, last month uh, recently, uh, one of my clients, he purchased a property two years ago. It got vacant last month. So I thought, OK, he's made some rent. Now he might be willing to sell. And I was low on stock. So I made an offer to him. I'm, I said, I'll buy back the property from what you paid for it. Are you happy to sell? He's like, no, Karthik, I'm, I'm happy with the rent, and I'll, I'll hold for some time. And within two weeks, the property got re-rented. 
So we have a local team of property managers who take care of all those things. Now, the reason why I'm focusing so much on Indiana is we also did some properties in Kansas City. We did some properties in uh, uh, Indianapolis. Those markets, I am not very happy with the performance of the managers. Things are obviously not going the way they, they, were, they were supposed to go. So this market, the quality of uh, people who are behind the scenes who are working on things, are, they are very ethical people, their integrity is pretty good, and they, they give good value. So you'll definitely be able to uh, get a good success story if you end up buying in the, these markets. Just an additional question to yeah. that. Just coming back to the property maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I do own a, a rental property myself here in Australia, and I found that uh, the upkeep yep. um, is an additional cost per year for us. Yep. So how do you factor that in? I would when say it's always good to budget some extra. Like in my numbers, I've said that you make a gross rent and your net rent is approximately 70%. Right. As a prudent investor, you should provide another 10, 15% towards 10, 15. Uh, long-term repairs because at the end of the day, within five years' time, you might have to change the roof or you might have to do something with the windows or have some bigger capital expense. So if you are keeping aside a small portion towards capital repairs, it always obviously comes out handy. And uh, like for, because obviously we have to show that the returns are good and which eventually are because of the foreign exchange and the rentals. So that's the reason for marketing purposes, that is the standard, like 30%. But it's always good to have be a little bit conservative and uh, get, get an extra provision there. Yep. Any other questions? Yep. Oh, okay. I'd like to check from the figure that you provided, uh -huh. the net percentage return, has yep. that included the tax? Tax paying in US or tax paying here? No, no, no. It's included only the property taxes, which is similar to land rates and taxes. So it doesn't include the income taxes or the taxes you pay in America. But okay. that's only, uh, if you're buying only one property, you get a minimum exemption of $3,800, like depending upon how you structure your LLCs. Mm -hmm. So anyone who buys a property, like you won't be buying it under your personal name. You'll set up a company in America, so you'll set up an LLC, and then uh, you become the member of that LLC, okay? So depending upon how you structure, you get the benefits, but there's a minimum exemption of $3,800. So if you're buying a $58,000, $60,000 house, you'll be paying tax only on only two or $3,000 because okay. there'll be some other expenses you can claim. So how much will the LLC cost? Is this part of your service? Uh, yes. Uh, normally, now, to sell the properties, we sell a membership, a US membership, like anyone would do. But uh, Jamie and uh, me, we were just uh, having a chat about the drop in the uh, dollar. And for next 30 days, like for the month of May, there's no charge for membership uh, for first 25 enrollments, because I think that pretty much we have another six months to buy properties. So we want to bring in as many members as possible. Uh, the setup of LLC would cost $1,000. And uh, uh, like we'll waive off the $5,000 membership fee. OK, the last thing. Yep. Since 21 century, education seems to have a big portfolio of customers, clients, and affiliated partners. Yep. Is it possible that we get US dollars loan? Because I believe, I believe the loans interest rate are very low there. I can get 3.99 for no. you, but it's still not as good no. as US interest rate, isn't it? The only reason why we can get properties at a discount is we bring money up front. So borrowing in America is not possible, but still in Australia, the, return, uh, the rate of interest is pretty low. So if you've got an investment property, you can easily borrow for, for, at 4.5%. Mm, I can yeah. give you 3.99. Yeah. <laughs> Thank give, you. Thanks. Give, I'll, if you have money, I'll borrow $1 million. We can do a deal right now. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> the deal is on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, there was a question over there. Yeah. So there hasn't been any problem finding tenants or anything like that? Uh, there are issues, but then uh, that problem stays to us. Like, you won't be bothered. Sometimes there can be a vacancy period. Normally, if you buy a new property, we'll give you a rental warranty where we give you a property with a tenant in place. Now, sometimes the tenant's financial condition might change. He might skip on rent. He might obviously um, slow down in making rental payments. So the property managers track all those things and keep you updated. If there's an issue, we obviously um, resolve that situation amicably, and we try and obviously bring a new tenant. On an average, I would say right now in Indiana market, we've got around 145 rental units. And the vacant units are around 20, 25. 
And out of those 25, 15 units are those where we don't even have access to the properties, like the work is being done. So the vacancies are only eight or 10, 10 units out of 145. So how long? How long? Like, I would say that... one month to four weeks is a good period to find a new tenant yeah, okay. if your property is nicely presented. Has it been um, a few that longer than that, or like yeah. what sort of? Yeah, yeah. there have been like properties which are rented within five days. Yeah. Like as I gave you an example, a property got vacant early this month, and within two weeks it was re-rented. Yeah. There have been cases where things have been dragged for four months or six months. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, if that's the situation, we just don't leave the client. We try and help them out. So in one case, the client was very passionate about US properties. She lost six months rent. She said, Karthik, uh, I want to buy another property, but obviously I'm not confident the way things are going. So I discounted the price of the new property by the rent she has lost. So I gave her a discount. Now she's got two properties, and both of them are rented. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I'm Thanks good in that. making deals, so yeah. There was one more. Yep. Just last question. So I'm um, currently on a high income, in the high income bracket for my tax, yep. so obviously I don't want extra income because I'm going to pay 48 cents in the dollar yep. on that. Um, what capital growth rates uh, are they predicting for the states? Did you mention before they were going down or? No, the property prices are going up because, and I would say within next uh, 12 to 24 months, a lot of local locals will start buying. And that's the time where international investors will start selling. And when the banks, start, banks in US start lending, obviously there's more local activity and the prices will go up. But in your kind of scenario, what we should do is, if you are interested in buying a property, uh, like some of them are in kind of cash flow areas where they, they might not be a massive growth potential, but there are some small neighborhoods which have a massive growth potential. So you should go for higher end properties and spend eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 for a house, go for a good quality house which can go up in value. And right. then also you can structure your LLCs in a different way to try and minimize uh, the tax depending upon obviously what kind of uh, family structure you have and like yeah, you can easily structure that. Yeah, right. Thank you. All right. I think that's up for today. So uh, I'll be out there so we can have consults and uh, like yeah, I would I would love to catch up.